Hello church, I hope you're enjoying worship today. I can't be with you, but I have a very special guest for you. His name is Jay Reynardis. Jay is an elder at Crossbridge. Crossbridge actually started at their house uh, 11 years ago. So I'm super excited to have Jay open the word for us today. Uh, Jay is a corporate lawyer, he's a litigator. And he is the BSF teacher here in Miami. He teaches the Bible every week to hundreds of men. So would you welcome Jay today? Good morning. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, it's been three years since I preached here, about three years, I figured out. And uh, this church is really special to me. Um, this place is really special to me because this was the very first place that I heard the gospel here uh, in a seat right over there. And so um, I am physically the fruit of this church and where it comes from. And all the ministry that, I, that God's graced me to, to, to use me with is a result of the faithfulness of this place over the years. And it's a delight to see it growing and, and all of you here and to get to share and open the word with you. The passage today um, is an interesting one. The life of Jephthah is, a, is an interesting one because... You know, uh, as we look and study the book of Judges, and we've been in Judges for a while, um, Jephthah is almost like the anti-judge. He, he, he's like the worst of the worst. If, if we're going to pick a judge and say, be like this guy, but not like this guy, Jephthah would be the one that would say, please, not this guy, because he's a, he's a walking disaster, um, and where we find ourselves in Judges 10, 11, and 12, interestingly, Jephthah almost stands out as the, uh, the embodiment of Israel. And what, what's going on in these chapters structurally from a view of Judges is that, um, as, as, as we read, the, the, there's a series of gods, seven different gods that, that Israel has turned to over the years. And, and it's not coincidental that it's seven because it's, it's a sign of completeness and, it's a, and, and the idea is that they've fallen so far. It's not just like one or two. It's like pick a god, any god, roulette wheel, throw a dart. That's the one we're going to worship, not the true god. No, we don't want him. Any of these other guys, that'll work for us. And, and Israel falls and falls and falls. And the, this is the bottom for them in the, in the book of Judges, in the period of Judges. Um, I, I don't even think that afterwards with Samson where we're going next week is, is as bad as it is with, with Jephthah. And the, the story that we have today, the story of Jephthah, the history of Jephthah, is one of a series of completely disastrous and failed negotiations. Right? Israel in chapter 10 comes, and if you have your Bibles, we're, we're going to talk a little bit all over these, these three chapters. In chapter 10, Israel um, comes before God and says, yeah, you know, guess what happened again? Yes, we, we are worshiping all these gods and we're wrong. Save us. And, and they try to have a negotiation with God. It fails. You know, God says, no, I'm not going to be negotiated with. And then, and then the elders uh, of Gilead go to, to Jephthah and say, well, let's have a negotiate with this guy because none of our people want to take head of the army and we're in disastrous trouble. And they have a negotiation with Jephthah and that doesn't work out for them very good. They just want him to come and win the war and then go away and uh, he ends up being in charge of all of them. That's not what they wanted. That negotiation failed. Jephthah has a negotiation with God about his daughter that we'll talk about. That negotiation failed. Jephthah has a negotiation with the Amorites. That negotiation failed. And, and, and even with the other tribes of Israel in chapter, in chapter 12. And that negotiation failed. It's a negotiation after negotiation after negotiation after negotiation. Failure, 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 failure. And it's something that we ought to stand. I mean, as a lawyer, that what I do is negotiate. That's a, uh, every day of my life, I'm in doing deals with people around the world, uh, negotiating deals, um, sometimes for lots of money, sometimes for no money or little money. It depends on which side of the table I'm sitting on, right? And that's how it works for all of us, you know? And the idea of a negotiation is this whole uh, economy, right, that we're used to. We're very comfortable in this world. Uh, we live in Key Biscayne. Florida, Miami, U.S., and we are quintessential capitalists. We, we know negotiation. And so I bring something, you bring something, let's see in the middle where we can find a comfortable place so I get what I need from you and you get what you need from me. That's the nature of the negotiation. You know, and along comes God and says, that's not my economy. It doesn't work that way. 
My economy is not a negotiation where you get to bring something and I bring you something. What do you have to bring to me? Absolutely nothing. And so God's economy is an economy of grace. It's a completely different language. It's a completely different being. It's a different core. It's a whole different idea. And, and, and as I stand here with you today, I know that what's true in my life, it's true in your life. That because we're faced with the same negotiating thing, negotiating in our marriages, negotiating with our children, negotiating with our employer, negotiating employees, negotiating with the cop not to give me a ticket, negotiating when I want to buy the rug for less money, our lives are an endless series of negotiation, and we bring that baggage to God. And God says, no, you're missing it. But it's so woven into the fabric of our cultural experience that it's almost impossible to leave behind. And we have to very think hard and pray hard and meditate hard on grace so that it begin to chip away at all the negotiations that we have. Because if you're like me, you automatically negotiate with God every time something happens that you don't like in your life. It's automatic. We don't have to think about it. Boom. It happens, and that's what's happening in this passage, and God is showing us in this passage a better way. And so we're going to talk about the passage in three, three, different, in three different ways. First, I want to talk to you about the scandal of grace, because grace here is scandalous. And then I'm going to talk to you about the irony of grace, and then finally the source of grace. So the scandal of grace, the irony of grace, the source of grace. And the scandal of grace is, is that Jephthah who has broken the typical cycle set up in the book of Judges for who a judge is. You remember that the, the, the cycle has been the people sin, and then the people repent. God raises a judge. The judge saves the people, and then there's a period of peace. And we've seen that again and again and again for more than a month. We've been seeing that cycle. That cycle is broken here, and we find Jephthah included among a, a list of six other judges that don't mention this cycle in that way. The five others are completely silent, and Jephthah's right in the middle of them. So there's two judges in chapter 10, and there's um, three at the end of chapter 12. And Jephthah is like the model for these judges. And, it's like, and, it, and like I said, it's almost like the anti-judge, because it works completely different with him than with the others. Yes, we have Israel repenting, not at first. First in chapter 10, they go to God and say, God, we need you, like a utility, plug me in, and God will fight your battle. Uh, we go to God, turn on the light, God's there, turn it off, I'm finished with you, I can go about my life. In the same kind of way. And God says, no, no way. And so, so he doesn't raise up a judge. And Israel instead goes and finds a guy. Who? That guy. Why? Because he's the one that can win. Obviously, it wasn't because he was a holy man. <laughs> it wasn't because he was exhibiting the, the qualities and the characteristics of God. It wasn't because he was learned in, the, in, 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 the, in Moses' writings. It was because he was a thug. He was a mercenary, and he could win. And that's why they went to him, and they went to him, and he negotiated a very shrewd deal with them. It's like, now, after you guys kick me out, you want me to come back and save you? Why should I do that? It's like, oh, well, you know, we'll bring you back. We'll give you a big name. You'll be in charge of everything. You'll be almost like our king. And he thought that was a good deal. It's like, okay, yeah, I can do that. So this guy is a son of sin, born of a prostitute. He is an outcast. He's a thug. He's a mercenary. He's a hustler. He's completely and utterly pagan. Culturally, he's pagan. And he is an opportunist. In, in Spanish, where I grew up in Puerto Rico, we would say, un aprovechado. This guy is aprovechado. In English, I would say, think of selling ice during the hurricane. After the hurricane, when everybody wants cold ice, and that guy that's selling the bags for 10 bucks, that's who Jephthah is. Great opportunity, let's make some money. He's an opportunist, and that's who he is. And, and the, the scandal of it all is that we read through this story and, and God says that his spirit comes upon Jephthah, and Jephthah murders his daughter as a Canaanite sacrifice to God. I mean, that's filled with all sorts of sinfulness and stupidity. 
And yet, we go to chapter 11, the hall of fame of the faithful of the Bible, and there's Jephthah. What? Yes. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, there's Jephthah. And God is praising him for his faith. And I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, that I got to scratch my head and say, it's like, come on now, you know, this guy did not live a good life. This was not a good guy. This guy was a walking disaster and a pagan, but in his heart, there was faith. And God still went to him in faith. And, and I think that, that for me, I, I, I start to think about Jephthah, and as I thought about Jephthah, I almost become like his brothers from the real mother. And I say, not you. Look at you. You're, you're a thug. You're a mercenary. You're a murderer. This is who you are. You're not part of us. You're not part of the family of God. You're not part of the holy. How can you be used by God? How can he put his spirit upon you? Of all people, you, murderer of your own child. You sacrifice your daughter like a pagan. How can God bless you? And that's the scandal of it, that he did. And then he raises him up as an example for us. Not to live the way he lived, by the way, but to embrace the faith that he embraced. And as I started thinking about how I, in my heart, think that I'm better than Jephthah, and how in our hearts all of us can read this and think, come on, we're in church on a Sunday. Jephthah would not have been a church on a Sunday, right? He would have been recovering from his hangover and doing other things. How can God? And I start thinking that I'm a little better than I really am, and I forget the nature of sin and the fact that I'm not any better than Jephthah. None of you are any better than Jephthah, and we have all as fallen as Jephthah. In James chapter 2, James says that whoever commits, commits the smallest sin is guilty of breaking all the law, right? And in Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know, I know you who... In your hearts, you're what? In your hearts, you're murderers. In your hearts, you're thugs. In your hearts, you're killers. In your hearts, you're pagans. And I see myself in Jephthah, and I begin to see myself in Jephthah, and that changes the way that, that, that I begin to feel about my sin, and it for forces us, and it forces me to remember that the issue of sin isn't whether it's a little sin or a big sin, and we all have our sins, right? It's like we have... In, in our society today, we have those sins that are okay. And then we have those sins that are not okay. And the ones that are okay, well, hey, wink, wink, hey, not that bad. And the ones that are really bad, oh, uh, not that guy. I'm not like that guy. And if you ever hear that judgy voice in your head, <laughs> that's exactly what's going on, culturally speaking. Well, I'm better than that one over there. So at least I'm not like that, you know? I hear, I hear that voice all the time, that judgy, head is in, it, judgy voice is in my head socially acceptable sins versus those that are not. And what we fail to see is that in the eyes of God, all sin is a horror. All sin is a horror, and all sin is a scandal to heaven. So why is grace a scandal? Because sin is a scandal. Sin is the true scandal. And if, if grace is going to work, if grace is going to take root, if grace is going to pierce through the heart of people like us, it has to be even a bigger scandal than the horror of sin is. And that's what God shows us in Jephthah. You know, it's going to be interesting one day when, when we're in heaven and we're looking around and we ask ourselves, well, who's here? And, you know, some people that fill these seats, really holy people, won't be there. That's true of every church. And some people that we never saw in these seats, probably the guys watching on Facebook, may be there. And that's the scandal of it all, that, that it's not us trying and trying and trying to do stuff to please God, to make him happy. That's bargaining. But it's rather his grace come upon us as the undeserved, wretched, dark sinners that we are. And that's the beauty and the mag. That's why in chapter 7 of Matthew, Jesus says, not those that call me Lord, Lord, that did all this religious stuff. He says, get away from me. I don't know you. 
That's the evil of religion, that it becomes a bargain. If I light enough candles, if I pray a certain way, if I go to a certain place, if I eat the right things, if I live this way, then God will be happy with me, will bless my life. And Jesus says, no. What you have to do is know me. Know me. Walk with me. Allow me to love you and love me. It's relationship, it's relationship, it's relationship. It's not religion. And, 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 and understanding this, this idea of grace will r- radically change our lives and radically move our lives. And, and the same way that Jephthah is saved from the disastrous human being that he is, is the same way that I can look up and say, God, you've saved me. And I am a disastrous human being because I know more about you and yet choose to work against you. How often? That in my heart I wish evil upon people. That, that, that in my heart I'm a thug and in my heart I'm a murderer and in my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart. Same for every single one of us. And this radical scandal of grace has to somehow pierce through and that's what God does and saves us from before the foundations of the earth to pour his blessings upon you and me. And the irony is that the world's greats, right, may be out. And the world's outcast and broken and messed up who never seem to get it together may be the ones that are in. Isn't that a colossal irony? Brings us to our next point. That grace is ironic. And here's, here, here's the, the, the miraculous thing in this passage. Is that you can get grace without getting grace. So you can receive grace without even understanding what you're receiving. You can receive the blessings of God in his grace and in his majesty and in his beauty and in his mercy. And not even really get it yet maybe over time eventually i think our churches are filled with people that have received grace and confess christ but in their hearts are still working on an economy where they're bargaining with god for life there are whole denominations set up on this idea that i am saved by the grace of god and then i have to earn my way as i go forward and it is a lie and it is sadness. Here, that's religion, you know. The interesting thing about Jephthah here also is that he, he's completely shaped by his culture, right? Jephthah has been cast out of Israel. He's on his own in the wilderness. Uh, he's, he's trying to make way as a mercenary, and he is completely shaped by his Canaanite culture. I was watching a movie with my daughter a couple of nights ago on the Hallmark Channel. Horrible channel. She likes watching Christmas movies in the summer. I'm watching this Christmas movie called The Christmas Miracle. You know what the Christmas miracle was in the Christmas movie? It was a comet. It wasn't the birth of Jesus that they were singing about and little songs in the background. It was the fact that this comet came and this woman traveled forward in time, and then the Christmas miracle is that she traveled back to be where she belonged. That was the Christmas miracle. Tell me that our culture isn't any more confused than Jephthah's culture. Our culture is wholly confused about who Christ is and his mission and and how to deal with him. And that's why we see this understanding. And we, we fail to realize that the issue is not the nature of our faith, right, which can be, is, is, for every single one of us confused because of the cultural baggage that we carry, is confused, but the object of our faith, who's a great savior, who despite ourselves, breaks into our lives to achieve the salvation that he desires in us, for us, through his spirit. It's not the nature of our faith as much as it is the object of our faith. And that's the irony of it. It's not how you live. It's not pleasing him. That, that, that is the economy of works, merit. I deserve this. I'm going to earn it. That was the economy with which the, the, the ancients saw the spiritual world in which we still see the spiritual world today mostly most of the time. If I do this, the deity will be pleased and will bless me with what I want. 
So I sacrifice the right way, I say the magic words, and the deity will please me. And that was how all the ancients saw the supernatural, and that is how we live most of the time still today. God, if I give you this check, you will give me a promotion. God, if I give up this chocolate during Lent, you will bless me. If I win the lotto, I will give you 11%, not 10, 11. I'll keep the other millions, but you get 11. I mean, how many, who, who's bought a lot of ticket? You're here. I know you are because I have too. It's like, God, I would be good with this money. He knows that I wouldn't be. I would be terrible. And so the, the, that economy of works, think about this, is an economy based on scarcity. It's an economy based on need. And so you need something and you bargain for it. And he needs something and he bargains for it. It's an economy based on scarcity and need, which is precisely the opposite of the economy that God tells us about in this whole book that's based on grace, which is an economy of overwhelming plenty, which God says, everything for you, my very best for you, I hold nothing back from you, and we go to him with nothing. So what's our bargaining power? Let me tell you, when you go into a negotiation, and your bargaining power is zero, that negotiation is not going to go well for you. It's going to be imposed on you. It's like when you go get a cell phone. AT&T says, you can't tell at and it's like, well, you know, I don't like that particular clause, clause 15.B in your contract, and we strike that one out. AT&T says either sign it or don't. There's the door. God is like AT&T. You have no negotiating power. You walk in empty-handed before him, and we throw ourselves at his feet and say, God, you, you, because of your grace, because of your mercy, because of your goodness. And that economy is an economy that's fueled not by works, but by love and by plenty, because it's eternal, and it will always be. The economy of grace will never end. It's forever. That's why in, in Isaiah 55, the prophet writes, God saying, Come to me without money and buy. You who are thirsty, come and drink and eat and feast because it's economy of grace. Without money, it's not about earning. It cannot be. And the problem is that, that, that these things bleed into our thinking all the time because we're living in one economy Monday through Saturday. And every TV show that we watch, every song that we listen to, every, every, every bit of media that bombards us, everything we read is in the first economy. The economy works. And then we come to church for an hour or so, and we hear about the economy of grace, and we expect that it's going to radically change our lives. But the reality is, how can it? How can it? Because we're feeding all our week on junk food and we don't have what it takes to run the race. Every time we bargain with God, every single time, it reveals which economy we're really living under. Earning and works versus grace. It reveals the worldview we've adopted. It reveals where our hearts are. And, and you know as well as I know that when the dark moment comes, when the hard phone call comes. It's one of two ways. God, if you blank, then I will blank. Or it's on our knees. You are God. Do what you must do. It's one or the other. You know, Jephthah did an atrocious thing here, right? So he, he, he's bargaining with God and he bargains away the life of his daughter. And, 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 and that's filled with, with absolute horror and atrocious consequences. And the irony is that Jephthah lost what he most wanted. So Jephthah wanted a name, a place, a family, respect. And in bargaining with God away the life of his daughter, he lost his name, his future, his place, his beloved. And the irony is that God had already given it to him because even preceding Jephthah's promise, God, whatever comes out of my door, and, 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 and what the commentators tell us is that it's not that he was promising an animal, not at all. This is true Canaanite worship. 
whoever comes out of my door, he, I guess he was hoping it was going to be a slave, not his daughter, I will sacrifice to you. But before he, those words came out of his mouth, the Spirit of God was already on him. We read in chapter 11. And so God, by his grace, had already purposed to save Israel through this fallen man. And in making the promise, the irony is that he destroys that which he wanted the most because he didn't rely on God's grace. Instead, he was relying on works, on his understanding and of works. And that's the, the scariest part. And, and you know, what the Bible teaches us over and over again is that God is not a utility. God is not a, a, a genie that we go to for things when we need them. That God is a person and he calls us into relationship. That he calls us to walk with him and talk with him. And his desire is for goodness. And his desire is to be known. And his desire is to be known by you and you can know him. That's the, the, the wonder of it all. Talk about grace that we can know him. And how do we know him? We know him through his word. And funny enough, when we look back at the life of Jephthah, had Jephthah known him, what was written in the book of Deuteronomy just by itself, he would have known that it was utterly sinful to sacrifice a human being, that God did not want that, that God did not receive that, that God thought it was a horror. He would have known that there was a procedure set up by Moses for redeeming bad promises to God, that you would make a payment and there would be a series of things that the priest would do and, and, and God would let you off the hook for making a stupid promise. Why? Because God knows we say stupid things. And this may be one of you that it's living under the burden of some promise you made to God sometime. That's not your burden, all right? You may want to let that thing go. It didn't help Jephthah, and it won't help us out. And the problem with Jephthah is the same problem with us, is that we default to this again, and then it destroys our life, like it destroyed Jephthah's life. Why was Jephthah's life destroyed? Because he didn't know the word of God. Because he didn't know the God of the word. Either one of them. This is not what God wants for you. And the irony is that we sit in the country with the most books. Irony, irony, irony. Do you see it? How many Bibles do we have sitting in our houses? How many versions do you have on your smartphone? And we would rather watch the Hallmark Channel. The Hallmark Channel. It's not the heat. The Hallmark Channel. Then go and spend time with him and his word and Go and spend time in him in praise. That go and spend time in him in meditation. That go and, 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 and use the gifts that we've been given to bless other people that we're continuing to dig in, to dig in, to dig into this consumeristic, mindless culture. Instead of living in the economy of grace, we choose to continue to live in this economy of merit and works that will destroy us. But when we begin to study this book and it begins to come alive to us, and if you haven't experienced that and you're new to the faith, let me tell you, it will. And when grace takes hold in your heart and you see yourself as the vile sinner you really are, I really am, and this really takes hold, you run to his word and you desire it like desiring water in the desert. That's Jesus' right pictures. Water in the desert, food for a starving man, that's what the word becomes. When that begins to happen, and you, that's when you taste the grace of God because he's drawing you to himself. He's bringing you to himself. And we, we, we begin to consume from the source of grace. Right? So our third point, the source of grace. And what is the source of grace? The source of grace is God and his goodness. It's him. It's all him. Who saved Israel? Was it Jephthah? No, it's the Spirit of God. Who saved Israel every single time? Why the Spirit of God? Why would God save these people? Because he had big plans for them. Their, the plans that he had for them was Jesus. The plans that he had for them was every single one of you. The plan that he had for them was us. And he was going to use them to bring his son into the world ultimately 
and to give us life through him. The word became flesh and it was full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. And that is truth. And it bids us, and he bids us to this day, come to me. Know me. The difference between religion and relationship is knowing God, relating to God, listening to God, feeling God, or doing stuff. And God is a person. And people, persons, must be related to. And God calls us to relate to him. He says, I want, you to, I want to show you my heart. I want to show you myself. And we say, no, 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 God. I want to do it this way. It can't be. It's, it, listen, there's not a relationship that you have in your life, not one relationship that you have in your life, where the other person doesn't set the parameters of how that relationship is going to work. They say, this is what I love and this is what I hate. If you want to deal with me, we're going to deal with me my way. That's what a relationship's all about. And God is exactly the same. Why? Because God is personal. And so he says, if you're going to relate to me, it's going to be through my word, through my written word, and through the living word. And that is the only way to relate to me. If we try to relate to him any other way, I mean, that, that, that's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. If we're trying to relate to God in any other way, that's religion. It's not relationship. It's something else altogether, and it won't work. Just like in the life of Jephthah, it won't work. It'll bring you darkness. It'll bring you despair. It'll bring you destruction. It's a dark road. It's a dead end. It will kill you. It will consume you. And God said, this is not what I want from you. I want to be known. Think of the Think of the, 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 the incredible grace of that, that the God of the universe, creator God, beautiful, majestic, holy, wonderful, wants to be known by you. And so he's given you himself, the picture into his heart, and he's given you his very best. He's given us his very best, his son. I've got nothing else to give you. I've given you everything. I've given you a complete picture of myself that you can absorb. He's eternal. We can't see everything, Right? And I've given you my very best, my treasure, my son for you. And that's the scandal of grace. That he would look upon us who are the vilest of sinners. Culturally embedded, running away from him. The, 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 the most privileged people in the history of mankind. We are the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1% of any human who has ever existed on the world ever, ever. And we gripe and we complain and we go about our ways, doing our own thing, and we're blind to his grace. And it's majestic and wonderful and beautiful. And listen, let me tell you, if, you're, if, you're, if your heart is stuck, but Jay, you know, the world, the things that I want, the future that I see. I can make you a promise, and I know this to be true, that God's plans for you are infinitely, infinitely more beautiful and better than your plans for yourself. And, and when you are lost and your faith is weak, all you have to do is look to the cross and say, because of that, I can trust him. Because of that, I can know. Because he rose in time, in space, in history, because this happened, I can take all these negotiations of my life and flush them down the toilet and say, I'm going to live in the economy of grace. And when that economy of grace becomes alive in us, and we begin to use it and live it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then the world sees him in you and you have begun to take the steps of eternity. Eternity has begun in your life. And so what do we say to Jesus who on the night before he died is lying there, prostate, tears of blood flowing down his cheeks? 
Does he negotiate with God? Does he say, God, no. He submits and he surrenders to the Father and he says, you know. I wish it could be another way, but I give myself to you and you know. And that's what he's calling us to. And we can do it for the same reasons we're about to come to the table and take communion because he gave his blood and he gave his body and that gives us the hope and assurance that this wondrous, wonderful God of grace will always persevere with us in love and hope for eternity. Isn't it ironic that we would give that away for sugar-coated candies? Please join me in prayer. And so, Heavenly Father, and there are those of us in this room that are just starting our walk and we're filled with questions and doubts and we don't know how can I trust? How can I trust? Lord, open their hearts to the wondrous grace of the cross. And there are those of us that have been on the, on the long road of obedience and we have been doing it just by the strength of our character because we love you. And we are also lost because that's not what you want and that's not what brings blessing and that's not what brings delight and that's not, not what you intend for us. And there are those that see you, Lord, and are broken and are weak, and we need hope, hope in a Savior who died and rose and will come again. And so, Lord, meet us where we are. Lord, strike down this bargaining lunacy that we constantly play with. And instead, fill us with love and fill us with mercy and open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and fill our hearts with your spirit for the glory of your son who bled and died and rose and lives for us today. Lord Jesus, it's in your name. Amen. God bless you all.